welcome everybody to, to our symposium today. It's, it's a joy to have you. And uh, my name is Molly Brown. I'm an assistant professor of psychology right here in CSH. And before we begin, I wanted to just provide a quick overview of some logistics for our symposium and to give you a sense of what to expect from today. So we're going to kick off today with opening remarks by Dean uh, Dr. Stephanie Dance Barnes from CSH, followed by uh, remarks from DePaul President, Dr. Gabriel Esteban. And then we'll hear from our interdisciplinary panelists of wonderful CSH scholars, followed by a moderated Q&A session by Dr. Doug Bruce, Chair and Associate Professor of Health Sciences. And then we'll wrap up with closing remarks by Interim Provost, Dr. Salma Ghanem. Uh, thank you again for joining us and I'll turn us, turn us over to uh, Dean Dance Barnes. Hey, greetings everyone. I wanna welcome you to the kickoff event for the College of Science and Health's uh, uh, 10th anniversary celebra celebration, um, where over the next several months, we will be celebrating 10 years of discovery and innovation. This will be a time for reflection, connection, and projection of the purpose of the vision of the college. As you all know, CSH was established with the purpose of elevating science and health teaching, strengthening research opportunities, and enhancing the natural collaborations between science and health faculty, staff, and students. The demonstration of our Vincentian values um, are, is evident in our academic programs, teaching, research, service, and community engagement. Today's interdisciplinary symposium entitled, What Must Be Done? Learning from the COVID-19 Pandemic to Strengthen Our Future provides such a fitting start to our college celebration. This pandemic has indeed presented a number of challenges and unfortunately, tremendous tragedies. However, the pandemic has also taught us a number of valuable lessons and identified opportunities for advancement for the, in the future. One thing that has been very clear, we have to let science speak. We have to let science speak. From defining the, the, the disease diagnosing and controlling the spread of the, the disease, treating the disease, and bringing to light health disparities, and promoting hope for the future. We have to let science speak. Science and health education and innovations are vital for the future, and the College of Science and Health is teaching, is teaching and research will continue to advance knowledge and service to society. I want to acknowledge Selma Ghanem, our interim provost. She will be um, providing closing remarks later today, but right now, I would like to take this time to introduce President Esteban. Under his leadership, DePaul has developed its uh, current strategic plan, Grounded in Mission. And this plan, it emphasizes the elevation of academic excellence and embracing a culture of creativity and discovery. Thank you so much, President Esteban, for being here today. And it's my pleasure to turn the mic over to you for remarks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and thank you, Stephanie. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the kickoff for the College of Science and Health 10th anniversary celebration. Over the past 10 years, you, our faculty, staff, students, and alumni helped build CHS into one of our showcase colleges. You launched more than 15 new bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree programs. You earn numerous grants to conduct research and contribute scholarly work to your field of study. Nearly 7,500 students have earned their degrees from CHS since it was established in 2011. Those alumni are now making a difference in a wide range of science and health professions. We've seen many of these alumni highlighted these past several months as frontline workers in hospitals and other medical facilities. In fact, we've seen how the entire CHS community has worked to make a difference during the global pandemic. Going back one year ago to the early age days of COVID-19, CHS didn't waste a moment to ask what must be done or how can we help? You took action immediately by donating thousands of pieces of medical grade PPE equipment to local hospitals. You collaborated with the College of Computing 
and digital media. They use 3D printers to make more than 100,000 face shields and plastic covers for N95 masks. Throughout the pandemic, you shared your expertise with media outlets across the country, from the mechanics of the COVID-19 virus to mental health, to community health monitoring. You have been interviewed by numerous journalists. You're also working closely with public health officials in the city of Chicago. Right now, we have more than 150 students and 20 faculty from the School of Nursing volunteering to help COVID, Chicago's COVID-19 vaccination effort. I hope everyone here gets their vaccines. Our faculty and students are helping at points of distribution throughout the city. Some students are finding opportunities to help administer the vaccine at clinical sites and hospitals. They're gaining real-world experience while serving the community. It doesn't get more of intention than that. You CHS have been a blessing for DePaul and the Chicago community. Please know how grateful we are for the work you do every single day. St. Vincent DePaul called on us to take action in service of others. He said, gentleness and forbearance are necessary among ourselves and for our service to the neighbor. In teaching, learning, and service. CHS certainly understands that empathy and patience are essential, especially after this past year. For 10 years, you have upheld the Paul community's Vincentian values. I know you will continue to do so well into the future. Congratulations on reaching this milestone. Thank you for all that you do for DePaul and our community. Please enjoy today's symposium. Thank you, Dr. Esteban. Um, my name is Douglas Bruce. I am trying to get myself on the video. <laughs> um, I am Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Health Sciences and honored to be um, the uh, moderator for this panel. Um, so I think the... Um, the panelists that we've assembled here represent the uh, breadth of the college, um, ranging from uh, the bench science, uh, the evolving um, knowledge around variants and vaccines that we're going to hear about, as well as big data approaches to um, um, understanding how COVID spread through the US, as well as some practice and research networks that we're going to hear about ranging from the um, distribution of PPE across Illinois, community-focused research on American, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities in the US, and nursing practice here in Chicago. Um, our first presenter is um, Sarah Connolly from Health Sciences. So without further ado, Dr. Connolly. So I'm Sarah Connolly. I am an associate professor in health sciences and biological sciences, and I'm going to provide an update on the current state of the pandemic, um, including a discussion of vaccines and variants. I'm a virologist, so I don't study COVID, uh, but I don't study COVID. Uh, so this will be a review of work done by many other people. Um, so Chicago currently has the lowest number of cases that we've seen since last summer. We have about 70 cases per 100,000 people per week. Um, this is still considered substantial. So high transmission is considered over 100 cases per 100,000 people per week. Moderate is over 50, sorry, substantial is over 50. Moderate is over 10 and low is under 10. So in the last few weeks, we've moved from that high category down to the substantial category. Uh, at our peak, we had 10 times as many cases. So the news is good, but we're not there yet. Uh, the story is similar for the country. You can see from this map that very few counties have reached that low level of transmission. Um, over the last year, we've lost over half a million people in the US to COVID. We've had nine, uh, 29 million cases reported. But the good news is that we've had 32 million people fully vaccinated. So the number of fully vaccinated people exceeds the number of people reported to have COVID. Um, 61 million people have had one dose, 
that represents 18% of our population. Um, 32 million represents about 10% of our population. Illinois and Chicago are about on par with the rest of the nation with Illinois having 9.4% fully vaccinated and Chicago has 8.5% uh, fully vaccinated. Um, how do these vaccines work? So the vaccines target the spike protein. And that's the protein on the surface of the virus. Um, it's the protein that's responsible for letting the virus bind to the cell and enter the cell. So this is our virus. It's an RNA virus, which means that its genes are coded in RNA rather than DNA like us. And the spike is shown here as little red spikes on the surface. Um, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines um, take the gene that codes for spike, take the RNA that codes for spike, and they surround it by lipids. And then they inject that in your arm. And the RNA is going to enter your cells. Uh, your cells will use that RNA in, uh, as instructions to make spike protein, but no actual virus will be made, just the spike protein. And that spike protein will be put on the surface of the cell so that your immune cells can be alerted to the presence of this foreign protein. Your immune cells, your B cells, and your T cells, they mature over time so that six weeks after your first dose, you'd be ready to fully quickly respond if you were actually infected with the virus. Um, B cells make antibodies. These are proteins that are circulate in your blood and they will bind to spike on the surface of the virus and prevent the virus from being able to enter your cells. Uh, T cells will recognize spike on the surface of any infected cells and they'll kill those cells so that those cells will not continue to make virus. mRNA vaccines are a new technology, but they're just using the same biological processes that you're doing all the time in your cells, right? Our, your cells are constantly using RNA to make proteins. Um, so this isn't an entirely new uh, scenario for your cells. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine also focuses on that spike protein, but they take the spike gene and they put it into a different virus so that they can introduce it into your cells. Um, the virus that they use can't replicate in you. It will drop the gene off inside your cells and then it'll be done. And your gene, your cells will use that gene to make the spike proteins to alert your immune system. We have three vaccines that are currently authorized in the US. That's Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. Pfizer and Moderna have two doses taken either three or four weeks apart. Johnson & Johnson is just one dose. Um, you can see the numbers for efficacy here. Uh, these are numbers that tell you the efficacy of protection against symptomatic infection. So when these trials were run, they were tracking how many people got COVID by showing symptoms. So these numbers don't actually tell you the efficacy against infection without symptoms, asymptomatic infection, which we know happens pretty commonly uh, for COVID. Uh, DeSalle is going to talk about what these efficacy numbers mean in a minute, but we've got 94 and 95% efficacy for, Moder for Moderna and Pfizer, as well as 72% efficacy for Johnson & Johnson. And you might look at these and your first thought would be, well, I want the one with the high numbers, but I want to emphasize that the Johnson & jo Johnson vaccine is a good vaccine. Um, it was tested later than Pfizer and Moderna, and there were variants circulating at the time when Johnson & Johnson was tested. So it's not actually a fair comparison to compare the numbers of Moderna and Pfizer efficacy against Johnson & Johnson. Um, on top of that, Johnson & Johnson, the, that vaccine was 85% effective to prevent hospitalization. And that's really what you care about the most, right? So it is a very good vaccine and I would encourage you to take it if offered. Um, protection is not binary. Um, these numbers, this 95 and 72% efficacy tell you about protection from getting the disease with symptoms. Um, but they're probably even better at protecting, the percentages would be even better at protecting you from death or hospitalization. Um, they're good at protecting you from sickness. They're probably protecting you from infection without symptoms as well. So I would say based on preliminary data, we're looking at maybe about 70%. Uh, protection from infection. That's all preliminary and we'll have to see as how those studies go. On top of that, it probably also provides you some level of protection against becoming contagious. So even if you, you got vaccinated, even if you got infected, you may have a less likelihood of spreading it to other people because you should have a lower level of virus actively replicating in you. Um, so the vaccines provide protection at multiple levels. 
And as you move down this list, the level of protection becomes less and less. So we need to be aware that if you're vaccinated, you still could transmit the virus, though probably not as easily as someone who is unvaccinated. So what about these variants? Uh, this virus has 30,000 base pairs or letters that make up its genes. And when we say there's a mutation, we, means that, we mean that one of those letters has changed. So changing the RNA will change the proteins. Um, coronaviruses typically pick up one or two mutations per month, and these mutations are random. Most of them do nothing to the virus or they might make the virus worse. We call it a variant when a mutation actually changes the virus's characteristics such as changing its transmissibility or its ability to evade the immune uh, response or its uh, lethality. Um, natural selection favors viruses that are more transmissible. Viruses that spread better simply spread better. Um, natural selection may also favor viruses that evade our immune response to the vaccine. If everybody gets vaccinated, um, the viruses that are susceptible to the vaccine don't spread as well as the variants that can resist the vaccine. Fortunately, natural selection does not favor lethality. There's no benefit to the virus but to killing its host. Um, there are three variants that have been in the news. Others are also being discussed, uh, but these three that you'll hear talked about most came from, they arose in the UK, South Africa, and Brazil. All of them have mutations in spike. And spike, we care about the mutations in spike because that's what the vaccine was directed against, right? So um, the UK variant here has increased transmissibility as well as probably increased lethality. That's an area of active research. Um, but the good news is that the vaccines work against this variant. The vaccines also work against the Brazil variant, at least so far as we know. Um, the concern here is that the vaccines don't work as well against the South African variant. Um, but again, this isn't a binary on-off switch. Uh, there is some protection against the South African variant. So here I pulled a figure from a recent paper showing um, some data about the ability of the vaccines to neutralize the different variants. So here they took serum from people who had been um, vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine with their full two doses. Um, if you take serum from those people and you dilute it 500 times fold, you can still neutralize the virus. So that's shown in the gray bar here. The same is true for the, um, if you're using that serum to neutralize the UK or the Brazil variant, it's still uh, neutralizing the virus just as well. But if you're working with the South African variant, you can't dilute the serum quite as far. So you can only dilute the serum about 200 fold before you lose, start losing the ability to uh, neutralize the virus. So it's not that the vaccines don't have any uh, protection, won't have any protection against this variant. It's likely that they just won't protect as well. Those efficacy numbers are gonna come down. And so manufacturers have started to make um, uh, this version, right? We could, if we need to, we can make a booster shot for a variant um, if the vaccine is not protecting against that variant well enough. So my final slide here is what must be done. Um, the first thing is get vaccinated when you're eligible. So Illinois is currently in phase 1B plus. Um, some county and city sites are still in 1B, but some pharmacies are vaccinating 1B plus. So 1A is, is healthcare workers, 1B is over 65 or frontline essential workers like teachers and cops. 1B plus includes medical conditions. And this is probably broader than you might know. So it includes obesity, pulmonary and heart disease, as well as smoking. Um, before you get vaccinated though, keep full precautions. Um, people, we see the numbers are coming down, people are gonna wanna start to relax, but it's not time to relax until the numbers are genuinely down to that low level or when you've been vaccinated, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the other thing you can do is help others get vaccinated. So you can help people book appointments. It's actually kind of, can be kind of confusing to know there are some residency requirements for different sites. So figuring out what category you're in of eligibility and what place has a vaccine, um, if you have access to the computer and time to do it. Um, so if you can help others book vaccines, that's a great thing to do. Also, you can help address hesitancy by providing information as well as compassion. So there are folks who are concerned about getting this vaccine. As you're gonna hear in a minute, the vaccine was fully tested. It was a full size trial. It just went quicker. Um, that doesn't mean that it's less safe. Um, 
And then the final thing is actually some good news. So this week, the CDC released some guidelines for vaccinated people. Um, once you're vaccinated, you still need to maintain masking and social distancing and avoiding crowds. And that's because what I told you about a minute ago, which is that the vaccine doesn't prevent you from becoming infected and possibly spreading it to other people, at least not 100%. Um, but the good news is that the CDC said that small gatherings of vaccinated people uh, are fine. You can be indoors, you can have no masks, and you can hug those people. So groups of vaccinated people can, can come together, small groups. Um, the CDC also said that vaccinated people can visit unvaccinated people in a single household if those unvaccinated people are low risk. Um, that's the reason for this sort of restriction is that to acknowledge the fact that vaccinated people probably do uh, transmit less than unvaccinated people, but we don't want to have large groups of people because we don't want to have any super spreader events. So in this case, if you keep it small, you can do it responsibly. Just be aware that many households have mixed vaccine status and the kids under 12 aren't going to be vaccinated until probably the end of the year. So that's all I've got for today. And I wanted to thank Dr. Molina from Health Sciences who gave me, we had a little talk about what was most important to talk about today. Thank you, Dr. Connolly. Um, next, we will hear from Desale Hatsky from Mathematical Sciences, who is going to lead us through some statistical modeling techniques for estimating the spread of COVID in the US. First of all, I would like to thank Doug and Marlene for inviting me to this uh, symposium. Uh, <clears throat> my talk will focus on the statistical uh, analysis for evaluation of vaccine efficacy and then uh, vaccine effectiveness. I'll not, I'll not talk about the science, actually, Sarah <laughs> gave a good foundation, so thank you, Sarah. I uh, will approach this one from a uh, mathematics and statistics background. So I am. Uh, a faculty member in the mathematical sciences. Uh, my background is statistics and biostatistics. So uh, as uh, Sarah mentioned that you can see that the Pfizer and the Moderna, even the Johnson & Johnson vaccines have shown amazing degrees of efficacy. The Pfizer vaccine shown that around 95% uh, at preventing disease symptomatic COVID infection. This after the two doses, and then the Moderna was close, kind of close to that number, which is uh, 94.1, uh, effective at preventing uh, symptomatic COVID-19 after the second dose. Uh, more than 40,000 people were enrolled in the, in the Pfizer vaccine trials, and then around 30,000 in the Moderna uh, vaccine trials. So the vaccine ability to prevent, as Sarah mentioned, you know, sy symptomatic disease is excellent. So it will go along with, you know, preventing a serious illness and then of course, uh, hospitalization and then and death. Um, these are very good numbers, you know, to show a difference between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated one. The, the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna did not require regular testing for COVID-19. They were not good uh, indication of how well the vaccine was you know, protected against the uh, asymptotic uh, disease. Um, the other things also just I want to uh, mention that there's a difference between vaccine efficacy and the vaccine effectiveness. Efficacy is just the performance of the vaccine in a clinical trial. So it's a, con a controlled situation and also well-trained people, uh, they administer the vaccine. But when you look at the uh, vaccine effectiveness, it is just basically the performance of the vaccine in the real world. So just the overall impact of the vaccine. So most of the time, the uh, vaccine efficacy can overestimate the, uh, the vaccine effectiveness. Um, but in Israel, uh, they, they vaccinated like around 30% of their population, which is like, I think, close to 3 million. So the number uh, they got, it was very close. They were using the Pfizer vaccine. It was very close to the actually the uh, uh, vaccine efficacy, which is like about around 92 or something like that. The vaccine efficacy is the number that I showed with you before it was 95. And the question is how these numbers are calculated. Uh, it happened to be this quarter I was teaching uh, survival analysis. Actually the Moderna one was the using this formula to compute it. It is the ratio of the you know, um, hazard for the vaccinated people divided by the uh, ratio of the hazard of the people uh, who was not vaccinated or the placebo group. 
And then also this one, it can take into consideration other uh, factors like the age and, and race uh, and gender of those uh, people participated in the study. But if you ignore those uh, covariates, as basically the crude estimate can be given by just the uh, DV, I, and then I put it NV. DV is just the, uh, the number of symptomatic COVID case in the vaccine group. And then DC is just, I call it the number of symptomatic COVID case in the placebo group. So uh, using that number, just to give you an idea, when you look at this table, basically what I did is I went to the uh, uh, paper um, for the Moderna, I extract the numbers. So there were 196 uh, symptomatic COVID-19. Out of these 11 of them were the, uh, they took the vaccine, vaccinated people. And then the other one was just, they took the uh, saline, which is uh, 185. So what I did is I just based on the, the formula that I showed you before, I computed just the, the, the rate, the risk rate for this. It was almost like 0.8%. And then for this one, like 0.1%. Uh, 0.14%. Uh, so when you compute the ratio, we call it relative risk, or we call it the uh, relative uh, probability, they call it. So the, the ratio of these two was happened to be almost 6%. And then the efficacy is, by, by the way, just one minus that. So you can see this basically I copied and pasted from the Moderna paper. It was published in the Journal of England. Just the min one minus the hazard ratio, which is the, the ratio, the failure rate ratio. Uh, it was like uh, 0.94. And the question is, and, and then I just went uh, to the paper. This paper, is, as I told you, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in February of this year. Um, so this is overall the number that I shared with you. And then, but usually we should not trust this single number. This single number, sometimes if the sample size is changed, you may get a different number. Just to give you an idea, look at this one. Uh, when you look at this, for this is using the gender, sorry, or using the race, they have, they have two categories, white and then community of color. Community of color meaning just non-white people. And so look at this one. What they have is the uh, symptomatic case, this one, this is from the vaccinated group. This is from the placebo group. So when you look, when using that number, you will end up getting like 97.5 <laughs> efficacy. But if you change this one, let's say if this number goes up by two, this will go down by 95. And then if this number changes by three, this will go to 92 or 91. So basically is what you need to do is you need to have to see at the confidence interval. Uh, even when you see for the older people, the efficacy, it was just 86. Uh, but what it matters is, as I told you, the, the, the confidence interval. When they constructed the confidence interval, they used the uh, 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 stratified Cox proportional model. And then also they, 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 they took the uh, widest confidence interval. There are many uh, ways of constructing the confidence interval. There are like 10 different techniques, but they picked the widest one, the most conservative one, which is, which is good. At least it should give you the widest interval. So when you look at this one, it's not that bad actually. It's almost like between 90, close to like 90 to uh, 97, like this. Oh, this is the overall one. Even these are not far away. But uh, when you look over here, of course, for the older people, it's kind of very wide. This is mainly because of the of the uh, the number of uh, you know cases in the uh, vaccinated group, and compared to the number of cases in the unvaccinated group. And also for the uh, uh, Pfizer, the number is kind of similar. This is the overall uh, 95 that they got, Molly that mentioned. And then these are just the other numbers taken into consideration of the other subgroups, you know, age, uh, gender, race, and then in country. Actually for the Pfizer, there was like three, uh, four countries, three countries were participated, uh, but the number of people participated from this country compared to US was just uh, very small. Um, and then you can see here, this is very interesting. Look at this one. When you look at this, this is kind of similar like the previous one. We can say that the efficacy for this one is 100%. It doesn't make sense. So the bottom line is what I want to say is just we have to look at the interval just to give you an idea because the actual number most likely will be somewhere around here. And this is just published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, actually on December 31st, basically just this year. This year. Um, now the question is how do you interpret it and how do people they see it? Some people they see like this. Uh, this one, it doesn't mean that uh, 
that 95% of the people are protected from disease with vaccine. It doesn't mean like that. So what it means is, this is just to give an idea, I, I put uh, four different uh, interpretations, basically. The risk of having uh, symptomatic COVID-19 infection among those who vaccinated was almost like 6% times as high at the risk of having symptomatic COVID-19 infection among those who do not uh, vaccinate. Or if you reverse this one, if you take one over this the other way, if you change like uh, the order, if you bring this one at the top and this at the bottom, um, what you're gonna get is you're gonna get 17. So basically the risk of having symptomatic COVID-19 infection, this is only for symptomatic, as Sarah mentioned. Among those who do not take, do not get the vaccine, it was like 17 times as high as the risk of having symptomatic COVID-19 among those who uh, got uh, vaccinated. So uh, think like this, let's say if there are 50 people out of 1,000 per 1,000, those uh, if you from the for the from the control group or the placebo group, and so what you need from the other one is according to this you need three people, three per 1,000 vaccinated group compared to 52 or 51 to uh, per thousand in the uh, control group. In other way, also if you using the uh, efficacy, you can interpret also like this: those who took the vaccine had uh, a 94 point, no, sorry, 94.1 reduction in risk of having symptomatic COVID infection compared to those who do not take the, the vaccine. So it does not mean some people, they think that, oh, 95% of the people are protected from the disease with the vaccine. It's not like that. It's just, this is just the risk. Um, the other thing is also, I was, I was interested to see um, if there is any different, like it's, if there's any significant difference between the uh, symptomatic and then asymptomatic uh, virus, this one's in terms of the infectivity. infectivity. Um, so our main research was that done. So one of the most is published in a very good journal. Uh, this is from Singapore. Um, and also I like, the reason I mentioned this one is I like the way they analyze it and the data looked like very re reliable. What they found out is they said the incidence rate of COVID-19 among the among cloth contact of the symptomatic index case was 3.8 times higher than those for close contact of the asymptomatic uh, index case. What it means is the people with uh, asymptomatic uh, COVID-19 are of course they're infectious, but they are less infectious than a symptomatic case. In, and then imagine now if the vaccinated people compared to the unvaccinated people the number is most likely will be higher than this. But by how much, if this is the, the significant difference between these two, it is like almost four times. The other could be, uh, I don't know, it could be 10, whatever, five, five or seven. Even if it's four times also it's significant. Um, uh, the other things also just we have to take into consideration that when you see the, the, the way this uh, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, Johnson & Johnson, the other vaccines, of course, they were just developed within short period of time. So there's a key limitation that the, the, you know, there's a duration of time for the efficacy can be affected. The other one is the, this trial is ongoing one. So at least like a two year, uh, you know, a period in order to follow them, in order to compute the right efficacy for the for the uh, <clears throat> for those vaccines. Another limitation also um, the lack of the identified correlated of protection. What I mean is this one is the protection against the disease or protection against the infection after the vaccine is is not known. Um, and then also there is no sufficient uh, data or information to assess the asymptotic infection. Um, but at the end of the day, just my final, to, you know, my uh, is I'm just going to echo what uh, Sarah said. This vaccine, they're very good. Even they look at this, if there's 70 or more, reduction is a big thing. The other one is when a lot of people in the community are vaccinated, the virus has hard time to circulate. Um, basically, we should not be, uh, you know, should not be the people who are contributing to those uh, different variants. But if the virus is going around, we're going to get different variants and it's going to be very difficult to treat them. Um, and then, of course, vaccinated protects not only ourselves, it protects also our, our community and other people. 
because there are some people they may not able to take the vaccine because of different reasons. Um, and then the other, just more the other, uh, this is more other uh, vaccine to prevent uh, both symptomatic and asymptomatic carriage. For this one is not known, but most likely also uh, the result could be similar. Uh, I think I have to end here because I have only given 10 minutes to do that. So if you have any questions, maybe you can ask him later. Thank you. Thank you, Desale. Um, as an epidemiologist, I um, I totally appreciate your emphasis on the confidence interval and in, in, in interpreting estimates like that. Uh, we're next going to hear from Eric uh, Lendall, who is going to um, lead us through uh, his experience in the Illinois um, PPE network. Uh, Eric is from the Department of um, Physics and Astrophysics. I'd like to begin by asking uh, everyone here to think back to the early days of the pandemic in Chicago uh, nearly one year ago. Uh, the emerging pandemic was certainly changing our lives. There was a, a lot going on uh, and, and also a lot in some cases not going on. But very importantly, um, the Chicago area was dangerously close to running out of hospital staff and beds. A lot of the danger came because staff could not protect themselves or their patients from the disease, as shown here first reported on the local news on March 27th, 28th, 2020. That night, uh, packages started arriving by bicycle courier on the home doorsteps of emergency room physicians throughout Chicago. They contained 3D printed face shield frames, a transparent shield, and a strap made from recycled sterilized bicycle tubes. In each package, there was a note. These materials are provided free of charge by the Illinois PPE network. Materials packed and sterilized by PPE manufacturing node number one, DePaul Lincoln Park. Chicago successfully flattened the curve. Almost nobody was turned away from a hospital in Illinois due to a lack of bedroom staff. And of course, many other cities and areas were not nearly so lucky. Uh, the PPE manufacturing deliveries that started on March 28th, 2020, continue till today, and they will not stop uh, until the need stops. DePaul's role in leading this effort came about because of senior leadership's commitment to its Vincentian mission, which, uniquely amongst all other institutions in the area, put lives ahead of policy. The Office of General Counsel endorsed removal of university equipment to the homes of faculty, staff, and students, and we we're empowered to fight the pandemic head on using our own skills initiative and self-governance. Eventually, although it took a while, in some cases, we got every major college, museum, and STEM center in the Chicagoland area to join us in what became the Illinois PP network. Um, this freedom from constraints of intellectual property, of reporting, et cetera, allowed us to do many things. One of the important ones was to tap into the global network of open source hardware and software to share designs. We were able to collaborate seamlessly with community makerspaces, as well as informal networks of designers to adapt ideas, such as the four hole punch common in Europe to the three hole punch that can be found in every office, or actually I should say, used to be able to found in every office uh, at DePaul. A lot of them will be missing when we go back to school uh, and hopefully we're trying to get those returned before it happens to get holes made in things. So iterative design and adaptation, along with connections to community leaders, politicians, and then using networks, as I mentioned, of bike couriers in the city and veterans groups uh, in the suburbs uh, to make deliveries. Uh, they were made direct to the homes of healthcare workers, workers in prisons, drug rehab workers, and so forth, always no questions, no judgment, and without any compensation. Uh, this continued um, for a long time, as I mentioned, still continues today. It wasn't uh, sadly until April 24th that uh, the FDA provided an emergency use authorization for homemade PPE, and uh, our operation uh, somewhat uh, was legitimated. Um, crowdfunding um, was provided through inspire.depaul.edu slash PPE, 
and that has raised the funds to operate our machines uh, 24 hours a day. Um, our organizing committee included not just the Paul faculty, but educators at all levels, plus museum employees, independent designers, community leaders, and clinical students who were in the final stages of their schooling and were then sent home at the start of the pandemic uh, from those last positions. You can see a couple of them here, including Alex Kloss from Rosalind Franklin who is key in able, uh, enabling us to get inside the emergency rooms of hospitals. Um, corporations, uh, particularly sponsors of the maker spaces here on campus, uh, donated supplies and helped with our supply chain. Bike stores donated the time of their employees as delivery people and also their used inner tube piles uh, to be uh, reprocessed into elastic, which should become in very short supply. Um, we developed the idea of a distributed manufacturing network based on a system of non-centralized manufacturing nodes inspired by mesh networking architectures to, allow, to prevent cross-infection of supplies or a PP product. As we moved into April, it became clear that we could not 3D print frames fast enough, even if, as shown here, you managed to fill your bedroom with 3D printers. A new single material design uh, coming out of the nearby Lane Tech High School makerspace allowed us to move from 3D printing to laser cutting, shrinking manufacture time from hours to minutes per design. Our bike courier network was used to quickly get prototypes into the hands of local doctors until we could distribute the new digital design worldwide. And finally, we scaled up production using a steel rule die process, which is essentially a way, essentially a way of stamping plastic quickly. Uh, to further drop the time per manufacturer down to seconds per shield. In our first run alone, we doubled the amount of face shields available in the state of Illinois. And by this time, uh, we have produced well over 150,000 face shields um, using uh, some of these scale-up processes as well as the original distributed manufacturing network. Um, I'd like to use my remaining time to talk a bit about a few of the other uh, initiatives undertaken by Illinois PPE. Uh, one of the interesting ones uh, that illustrates our method is uh, goggles. Goggles um, were made in response to requests from clinicians because our glasses tend to fog, um, they're expensive, and so we use our flat pack shield experience design to base a set of goggles on chemistry lab goggles. Uh, it's now used in COVID wards and vaccination field sites across the United States. The initial request actually came from a 60-year-old emergency room nurse who was the person who treated the first COVID patient in the Midwest. She received one of our first shipments in March. She now wears her set of goggles every day. She has yet to be infected uh, with the disease. Starting in April, we bought dozens of sewing machines and applied our node network system to creating sewing groups that could turn out cloth face masks that met clinical guidelines at scale. We developed 3D printed and vinyl cut tools to speed up the labor intensive sewing process and develop new designs for child friendly masks, such as the shark mask uh, with the long elastic strap shown here. Elastic is no longer in short supply, thankfully, um, as well as hospital caps, something else uh, requested by a lot of clinicians. Collaborating with Stanford University and the Rosalind Franklin Medical School, we developed fit and particulate testing to validate different cloth face mask types, settling on the Iris Luckhouse design for most of our work. Uh, with design which came out of Germany was translated over the internet to us. I only had the chance to actually talk to Iris Luckhouse herself uh, recently. Um, it uh, became the one that actually best approximated a 95 um, performance and we found ways to test it with expensive materials such as incense as a uh, aerosol surrogate shown here. Using our acquired skills at bulk material acquisition and handling, we have at no cost outfitted school buses and classrooms with barriers to allow education to begin under CDC guidelines. And without the exorbitant costs charged by industrial manufacturers of acrylic, plexiglass, and other high-priced materials that can cost school districts of up to $5,000 per school bus, for instance. This work continues. In fact, just this past weekend, we completed the outfitting of the Menominee Nation uh, school bus fleet as shown here in Northern Wisconsin. And realizing uh, that the ultimate protection to healthcare workers and first responders would be the vaccine, we began an education campaign where we translated the most recent results appearing in scientific journals and public filings from pharmaceutical companies into reference facts 
in a format of social media friendly posts. Each was fully referenced, featured uniform styling, and had a countdown of over 60 days from late November to late January, a time in which in our estimation almost all stage 1A vaccine recipients had had their opportunity to receive their first shot. As a first group to receive the new class of vaccines, we wanted to make sure that they had the most scientific, recent scientific uh, information at their disposal with a way to track it back to the original scientific papers. And as most of us know, most of the scientific research on COVID and the vaccines is made publicly available free of charge. With many decades of combined experience writing and reviewing scientific and clinical papers, we were able to confidently translate our academic skills into a public education campaign that garnered attention and retweets from medical school faculty from Harvard to the University of California. When I was asked this question by the organizers of the CSH 10th anniversary symposium, my answer was not initially very enthusiastic. And the reason is that we're tired. Our arms and backs hurt. Our lungs are filled with uh, plastic particulate. My hands are cut up from handling plastic or all the other, as are the other members of the network. And none of us have slept a whole lot uh, since March. And it's not from watching bad TV shows. Uh, I know I speak for most of the hundreds of volunteer participants in the network when I say that we're burnt out and that living in a faculty, in a, living in a factory, even one with cool toys like 3D printers and laser cutters really isn't all that enjoyable. Um, but the real answer is that what happens next is preparation. Crisis preparation is not about being ready for every bad thing that could happen. No policies, no bureaucratic organization, and no handbook exists when you're really in a time of crisis. I have learned that actually preparation is about two things. The first of them is adaptability and specifically the training to be adaptable. And secondly, the networks of people that build the communities that you rely on in a time of crisis. Illinois PP got started because we had a community that crossed education levels and institutions. It was a community that endorsed rapid iterative design, sharing of digital information and valued adaptation. It also was a community of people with the skills to make things, design things, test things, and scale up the manufacture of things. Most of us met as the citywide external advisory board of DePaul's makerspaces, the Idea Realization Lab in the Loop, and the IRL2 in Lincoln Park and SAC. And so I'm happy to announce um, that starting this fall, a collaborative effort between CDM, LASS, and CSH will be accepting its first incoming students into a new undergraduate degree program a BFA in industrial design, designed to formally train students in iterative design, the conceptualization, prototyping, and scaling up of the manufacture of things. The industrial design program, which includes many courses already in the liberal studies program, will uniquely prepare students to take on the challenges for which they're not prepared, but nonetheless challenges that they'll be able to confront by an education that crosses the arts, sciences, and technology. It's my hope that they'll be ready and that DePaul will have fully built out its manufacturing, engineering, testing, and design facilities so we're even better prepared for the next crisis. Since a distributed manufacturing network requires by its nature lots of participants, we'd like all of you, our students at DePaul and listening today, to consider uh, taking some informal classes in digital fabrication at the Idea Realization Lab upon reopening, but also consider taking some of our new credit hour courses, particularly in processes of manufacturing in different materials. They'll be offered next year, both during the regular terms as well as the December intersession. I'd like to end then uh, by thanking the entire DePaul community for their support of this effort. Every once in a while, I get to get out of uh, the factory here and uh, hop on my bike and make a few deliveries myself. Uh, the appreciation of the clinicians and first responders is real. The desperation is less, thankfully, than last March, but we can still help. Please contact www.illinoispp.org or email me directly if you know anyone anywhere in need of protective equipment or any of the other supplies or educational materials you've heard about in this talk. And thank you. Thank you, Eric, for that inspiring presentation. Um, it speaks to the grassroots efforts of 
citizen scientists and fabricators um, answers the question, what must be done? Um, so we're next going to hear from Annie Saw, who is a um, faculty member in the Department of Psychology. And Annie is going to um, speak on her uh, work as um, one of the leaders of a uh, research network, <clears throat> a um, multi, multi site research network across the US that is um, conducting community based research with um, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, and specifically speaking on COVID today. Thanks, Annie. Great, thank you. And thanks for having me today. Um, I'm excited to share some of my work with you all. And just for a little bit of background, um, this particular project um, came out of a request by the Tri Congressional Caucus um, and the two Native American um, Democratic uh, Congress people who caucus with them. Um, and they asked a group of psychological associations to study the impact on the current pandemic on different communities of color. Um, and so we are supported by a bunch of generous philanthropic foundations, as well as the National Urban League, which is a well-respected historical uh, civil rights organization. And we work in partnership with um, our group does the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and with our community partners and other research and works and advocacy organizations. So it's a really interesting um, and novel partnership for me to be doing research that is so closely connected to policymakers and um, advocacy organizations. Um, I wanted to start by paraphrasing something that one of my collaborators, Dr. Ray Samoa, mentioned last week in our call, which is that the acuity of COVID-19, it simply magnifies health disparities our communities have long faced. And particularly for Pacific Islanders, but also for Asian Americans, we have been shouting out our needs for a very long time and often our needs and the issues that our communities face are not not covered, not addressed, not researched. And so this is an interesting opportunity and an important opportunity for us to lift up and advocate for the needs of our, our different communities. A little bit of background on um, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities were two distinct racial groups. Oftentimes we're lumped together as one, but we're actually two distinct racial groups. Um, Asian Americans comprise um, over 40 different ethnicities and languages uh, Pacific Islanders include 30 or over 30 ethnicities and languages. A lot of our community members are foreign born and coming from many different countries of origin. Our communities represent the most educated, the most well off and the healthiest as well as the least well off, the least educated and the least healthy. In terms of community specific impacts due to the pandemic, I'm just going to highlight two that are covered in, in some of our um, work, this current work, but also been shared within our, our communities um, and asked to be lift up, lifted up. One is that, and again, this is not something that is well covered in, in mainstream media, but there has been a disproportionate number of COVID infections and deaths among Pacific Islanders. Rightfully so, we hear about how um, Black and uh, Latinx communities are being impacted by COVID, and, but actually Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are also disproportionately impacted. In many states, the case rates for COVID and the death rates for COVID are higher than every other racial group. Um, a lot of these states are concentrated in, in mountain states um, here in the Midwest including in Illinois and also in some Southern states. So this is something that our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander colleagues have been shouting from the rooftops and just wanting folks to understand is that they, this particular group is highly, highly impacted by the pandemic and not um, being well, well cared for. Um, some of you might be aware that since the news of the pandemic coming, um, the virus coming out of China came out in January, there have been increased discrimination and violence towards those who are perceived to be Chinese or Asian, Asian American. Um, and in fact, one of our research partners, the Stop AAPI Hate Reporting Center, 
um, has been tracking these hate incidents since March 2020. And between then and mid-January, received over 2,800 hate incidents, ranging from verbal assaults to being coughed or spat upon, to being cyberbullied, to being violently assaulted. Um, just in the last few weeks, there have, um, have been a rise in coverage on hate incidents, particularly for Asian, uh, for elders in our communities, um, including an 85-year-old San Francisco resident who was shoved so violently he died several days later. So there has been a renewed focus on um, these incidents, but again, not very well covered in, um, in media attention uh, regarding the pandemic. Our hope in doing this work is to shed light on our communities that are not well covered. Um, so we are conducting a national needs assessment survey of a total of 5,000 Asian Americans and 1,300 Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders recruited through our community organizational networks, as well as a, a small proportion through uh, Qualtrics panel data. We're also following up with survey respondents to the Stop AAPI Hate Reporting Center to understand better what the mental health and other impacts have been of these hate incidents. Um, and we're also collecting stories from our community partners and their constituents. Our approach is different than many of our research counterparts in that we are a large multidisciplinary team across the US um, of nationally recognized experts who have a really long track record of engaging our communities. And so we have trust built um, over long periods of time of, of community engaged research. Our team also includes really motivated and passionate community partners and graduate students and undergraduate students and actually have a high school student who works on my team as well. Um, and because we're engaged community members, we also are really committed to advocating for our communities and not just collecting research on them. Um, community organizations have been really engaged in this research process from identifying the key areas of focus for us, guiding our research design, including developing and vetting our questions, supporting translation and back translation into 13 different languages, um, promoting our research to their networks and also developing their own research. Um, this project is also unique in that we have tried to tailor our outreach and recruitment efforts to community needs and opportunities and constraints. So uh, some students and I actually, it was the first time I had seen them since March, um, were at a vaccine drive in Chicago Chinatown last month collecting data at, um, of Chinese um, elders in Chicago. And our hope is by collecting stories that we can elevate some of these very local community stories to national, more national audiences. And we've started to do some of that. Um, just to share a few of our um, findings so far, um, we have, our results suggest that there are very specific and acute needs within our communities. Food access is something that we don't often think about when it comes to Asian American or Pacific Islander communities, but in fact, we're finding that a third to a half of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders need, need help accessing food, especially those who are low income and foreign born. And th these needs existed pre-pandemic and they're being exacerbated now. Other priority areas include mental health and healthcare access, housing, um, utilities and internet access, help with employment and employment benefits. And actually since January of last year, a lot of our small businesses have been struggling. Um, and a lot of those workers, unfortunately, are not uh, paid over the table. And so they're really struggling to um, receive any sort of benefits now that they're unemployed or underemployed. From our communities, we're hearing very specific stories from our Pacific Islander COVID-19 response team. We're hearing um, that we really need to focus on COVID deaths of folks under the age of 65. 37% of deaths among Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are of folks who are under 
age 65 and currently ineligible for a vaccine. So when we're thinking about equitable di distribution of the vaccine, that's something we need to pay attention to and often overlook. From um, the Indo-American Center here in Chicago, we're hearing stories like this one that um, the executive director shared with me of a young couple with a newborn who were, evict who were evicted from their apartment. But they have no recourse because like so many people, these are her capitalizations and extra O's. So many people in the neighborhood have no lease agreement. They pay their rent in cash. They have no utility to their name. So when it comes to rental assistance, assistance they don't qualify. One of our collaborators in New York have talked about the mental health needs of Filipino nurses and other healthcare professionals. Because of cultural stigma, uh, very few people want to even talk about mental health struggles or seek help for them. But we know that our nurses and other healthcare professionals are really, really have been struggling for a long time. Um, and especially now that they are so overworked and under supported during this pandemic. Um, and they're not vocalizing their needs and they're not getting help for their needs. Related to anti-Asian hate incidents, we, as, we, as I mentioned, we followed up with um, adult, speaking, uh, adult English speaking respondents. And we've heard some of these stories of being called racial slurs, being coughed upon, being physically assaulted, being spit, spit upon. And among these re respondents, um, there are some pretty serious mental health concerns. 42% are experiencing current anxiety symptoms, 30% are experiencing current depression symptoms. 39% of these hate incidents reach the level of being categorized as ra um, racial, racial trauma stress um, or uh, actually traumatic. 95% of our respondents now view their own country as more physically dangerous to people from their racial or ethnic group. And following these incidents, um, participants are reporting elevated hypervigilance, physical symptoms, depression symptoms, and also intrusive thoughts. We're hearing for, from our community the need for more linguistically and culturally appropriate resources, more funding. They're getting the same amount of funding as other organizations, but doing it doing so um, when they have triple the amount of work to do, translating documents, um, creating all, the, all of their materials into the multiple languages of the clients they serve. Um, initially, um, here in Illinois, unemployment forms were only available in English, Spanish, and Polish. And so our um, Chinese-serving organizations had to translate every single form for every single client, um, and which took much too much time. Um, and like I mentioned, food access was, has been a real concern for our communities and small business supports. So organizations that had never done uh, food deliveries were now pivoting to delivering food for, for their clients. And as we look ahead, um, we're certainly continuing to collect our data and wrap up data collection within the next few weeks, but we're still growing out our coalitions. We now have dozens of organizations who are working with us a lot here in Chicago, but really all over the country. Um, and what we're hoping is that we can as, serve as a model for folks doing research on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders um, and demonstrate that we really need to include these populations in surveillance and other research efforts and to do so in language and to do so in partnership with community organizations who are so critical to reaching participants and getting the perspectives of those who are at least well served or understood. And we're certainly trying to disseminate our work so that we can advocate for more resources for our communities and um, to focus more attention to the additional burdens that Asian American and Pacific Islander led organizations uh, face. Uh, we're also trying to um, focus attention on the most vulnerable, those who are undocumented, those who are not eligible for um, unemployment and other assistance at this time. So I, I know I'm running out of time, but wanted to shout out um, my big research team, including the undergrads and grad students here at DePaul who are providing so much assistance for this massive project. Thank you, Annie. Um...
for that great presentation in shedding light on you know the um, often underserved and excluded populations, um, particularly when it comes to healthcare access in this country. Um, our final presentation is going to come from the School of Nursing, um, Shannon Simonovich and Kashika Weber Ritchie. Wonderful. Well, I would like to thank all of the other panelists for their incredible work and for the ways in which they've supported those of us um, in the healthcare field that are on the front lines of this. I am delighted to be re representing the School of Nursing with my colleague um, today to discuss um, our study, Nursing Practice During COVID. Today, we'll be talking a little bit about lessons learned from the front lines. Um, so just to introduce the two of us, today's speakers, um, I'm Dr. Simonovich. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Nursing. My background is in public health nursing, and I traditionally did a lot of food insecurity and maternal child work previous to COVID. Hi, and I am Kashika weber and I am in the School of Nursing uh, Assistant pro uh, Professor, and uh, a lot of my work is in prevention of childhood obesity in African-American populations, looking at the role of parents. And um, I'm originally, uh, a lot of my work is in reducing health disparities in vulnerable populations. All right, so just a brief outline of what we're going to be talking about in today's presentation. Um, we're going to begin with talking about what must be done, um, where I will discuss our study conceptualization and its design. Um, and then I will be passing the baton to my colleague to talk about the study findings, as well as discuss the future outlook um, implications for nursing practice in a post COVID-19 world. All right, so what must be done as a social justice oriented Catholic nurse, um, I felt very called to, um, to think about our mission and our values um, as we entered um, the pandemic. Um, like other faculty on this um, committee, I'm going to bring you all back to March when the streets were empty, everyone was terrified. Um, and as a nurse scientist at home with my um, family, not practicing clinically, um, I kept hearing from my colleagues on the front lines about um, the challenges that they were facing, how frightening um, it was. Um, and I thought to myself, um, how can I, as a nurse scientist, best support my colleagues on the front line? Because it was clear. Remember, you know, as of March, 19, March and April of 2020, the virus was rapidly spreading. Nurses were experiencing fear, feeling very overwhelmed and very unprepared to care for COVID-19 positive patients. Um, in reviewing the literature, of course, at that point, there was no known study that examined nurses' experiences providing bedside care during what we'll, we now know was the first wave of the pandemic. Um, discussing how their institutions prepared them for working with this emerging infectious disease, what the implications COVID-19 may have had on not only their nursing practice, but also their pers professional perspective. So um, I felt called to create a study here at DePaul School of Nursing. Um, we titled our study An Examination of Nursing Practice. Um, it is a large scale qualitative research study describing the experiences of nurses during the COVID-19 pandemic. And our, our website is presented there if you'd like to take a look. So what did I do? Well, I did what any good nurse does. You ring up every one of your brilliant friends and colleagues that you know from across practice disciplines. Um, in total, there are 14 doctorally prepared nurses who are both researchers and advanced practice nurses, um, all of, nearly all of whom have connections here at DePaul School of Nursing, whether that is in full-time or part-time faculty roles. Very, very lucky to have them all um, with me. We also, um, because of the scale of this study and the speed with which we were hoping to execute it, um, we reached out to our students. Um, in some, we had 10 re uh, research assistants um, who volunteered their time during the first wave of the pandemic um, to help us with collecting our data. 
We were lucky enough to secure funding mechanisms very quickly. Um, our work was supported by the Zeta Sigma chapter of Sigma Theta Tau, that is the chapter here at DePaul University. We also received funding from the Illinois Nurses Foundation. And lastly, we received um, some discretionary funds from the College of Science and Health and School of Nursing. And we're thankful to all of our partners because without them, we wouldn't have been able to conduct this research. So the general purpose of our research was to describe the experiences of nurses during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. We conducted one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews with 100 nurses across the United States from May to September of 2020. Each of these interviews was conducted by a nurse who was as similar to the nurse, the participant as possible, um, both with regards to clinical background um, and racial and ethnic characteristics to ensure that we had the opportunity to build trust and rapport um, as we discussed some very sensitive topics. I'm now going to pass um, the baton to Dr. Robert Ritchie who will discuss our study findings and looking forward. Okay, hello everyone. So over, um, we're going to talk about the study findings. Over approximately a five month period, we recruited 100 diverse sample of nurses in regards to race, ethnicity, specialty areas of practice, types of healthcare organizations, and geography, with approximately 60% ethnic minority representation and an average of 11 years of experience in nursing. So these weren't novice nurses. As you can see in this little pie figure, nurses were from all uh, types of institutions. Uh, well, from this pie figure, all different uh, specialties across the Chicago metropolitan area, which with the largest areas, the blue and the orange area representing the emergency department and labor and delivery. <clears throat> So uh, the results that we will talk about today are from our first three papers, and these focus on communication, PPE, and distress. So I would like to point out our first paper uh, has been accepted for publication at the, in the Journal of the International Nursing Review for the COVID-19 special issue. May 12, 2021. And the International Nursing Review goes to 130 countries. It's the official journal of the International Council of Nursing, which will be translated into Spanish and Mandarin. The two other papers, they, they have been submitted to publication. There is a lot of work that will be coming out of uh, our findings with approximately 10 publications. I do like to also point out um, that our study findings will be presented at the Sigma Beta Tau International Congress in Singapore in July 2021. And this will feature a panel of six of our DePaul School of Nursing faculty team. All right, so in regards to um, our findings of what was uh, surrounding uh, communication, effective communication during COVID-19 focused around three areas, um, and it should occur at the organizational level, uh, unit level, and among nurse to nurse. And so the three areas that are essential, as you will notice in the figure here, is presence, education, and emotional support. And these are all essential in impacting patient care and nursing practice. So to focus on, as noted in the previous slide, that presence was a key in all of those different areas. And these are exemplar quotes that focus on presence. I would say tons, tons of support. Our CNO, she's our senior vice president of operations was very visible every day. Another quote was, I remember driving in at three o'clock in the morning, uh, one, um, my regional CNO giving me a call and saying, are you okay? I'm heading in with you. I know you're coming. So some examples of 
communication and when it's effective, it involves open, timely, transparent discussions, physical presence with meaningful engagement, connecting frequently, changing guidelines to evolving science, and having shift huddles. It also entails effective communication that reinforces verbal communication. So to, that brings us to the point, the future outlook. What are these implications for nursing practice in a post COVID-19 world? So let's now discuss what are the implications for a nursing practice? What is needed? Ensure safe workplace environments through stable and standard protocols involving nurses and decision-making, clear communication from strong leadership and advocacy. And this looks like providing access to adequate and appropriate supplies. And most importantly, mental health resources that include strategies that um, support nurses during these times. Implications for nursing education. This goes uh, to just the hard skills and soft skills. And these are essential. Some examples of hard skills is, uh, are increased utilization of simulation education. It also goes back to that advocacy. You're providing um, nurses with ongoing PPE training and education about donning and doffing of PPE and fit testing and about infection, disease, and public health education. Soft skills look like critical thinking, resilience, strong communication skills, and um, practicing self-care. So uh, what would nursing look like in a post-COVID-19 world? COVID-19 has reinforced the importance of the nursing work workforce. Nurses are the most trusted health professionals and have provided more direct patient care during the pandemic than any other group. Nurses possess a unique skill set that pre prepares them for leadership during times of crises. They rise to the occasion even when there is cost to sell. So providing nurses with proper support is imperative because this translates to better clinical outcomes across healthcare systems, and it aids in achieving healthier communities. So please join our nursing during COVID-19 listserv. There are some links here provided on the slide, and um, you can visit our website to learn more about the study. Thank you. Thank you, Kashika and Shannon, um, for the presentation. Um, sorry it was so brief. I'm sure we're going to be hearing more and more about the findings as they evolve. Um, finally, we're going to close with some remarks from um, Provost uh, Salma Ghanem. So, okay. Thank you, Provost Ghanem. Thank you. And please call me Salma. Um, what an amazing panel. Uh, to be honest, I thought I was going to be able to get some work done while the panel was going on. I put all my work aside because I was tr truly riveted by uh, the presentations. Uh, the thing I would like to say is I was looking at the website of the College of Science and Health and the following statement is highlighted on your website. It says, at DePaul, at DePaul's College of Science and Health, you'll find a place where science meets humanity and where advanced knowledge aims to advance society. And I really think that the panelists today demonstrated how those words are put into action in terms of research, in terms of community engagement, and how quickly the college addresses emerging challenges from a variety of disciplines and perspectives. It's truly an amazing array of work has been done since the beginning of the pandemic, and we are really at the one year mark. I don't know if I can call it an anniversary. An anniversary is something happy, but uh, it is a year nevertheless. And I wanted to thank you, Sarah, for showing us that there is a decrease in the number of cases, but still reminding us that we have to be careful. 
and thank you for explaining how the vaccine works, especially as we're all hoping to get the vaccine soon. I also really appreciate the Sally's explanation of the difference between efficacy and effectiveness of the vaccine and really drilling down to the numbers and what they mean. Eric, when he told us about the work that was done by the Illinois PPE network, I was truly amazed by the work that can happen when people band together. Uh, this collaboration is also seen in the new program that he mentioned in industrial design where several colleges at DePaul work together in the development of that program. Annie's work on the impact of the pandemic on Asian Americans and Pacific Island, uh, Islanders is truly sobering not only in terms of the impact of these communities, and I apologize for my dog, uh, in terms of deaths, but also in terms of the hate incidents against Asian Americans. And the stories she shared were truly riveting. Shannon and Kishika's work on the experiences of nurses in terms of communication, PPE and distress reminds us about the importance of communication cannot be overstated not only for the nursing community, but for every organization, especially during this time. But please allow me to take this moment to thank all nurses for everything that they do and to thank you all for all the work that you have done uh, in terms of how you have worked to deal with this pandemic and to focus on uh, research in this area. But also, I would like to congratulate everyone on the 10th anniversary of the college and a special welcome to Dr. Stephanie Dance Barnes, who joined as Dean of the college at the beginning of this academic year. While Stephanie, you joined us at a very difficult time, I'm sure you must be awe-inspired to lead a college with such amazing work that is taking place. The dedicated faculty and staff and the hardworking students truly demonstrate the importance of science and health in our world. All the work is truly infused with sentient values, and it is very evident in today's symposium where the focus was on what must be done. What must be done, not only during COVID, but throughout all the activities of the college. Thank you for embodying our sentient values, and thank you for all that you do, not only for DePaul, but for society at large. I'm in awe. Thank you. Thank you, Sala. Um, so we are, that brings us to a close. So I want to um, thank all the presenters. Um, we, I apologize for <clears throat> having them wrap up their comments <laughs> in expedited fashions. I feel like we could have listened to them all uh, for much longer and I'm sure we will be hearing more and more about their efforts as um, the year progresses and the 10th anniversary uh, events um, progress over the spring quarter. So um, thank you again. Thank you to the attendees and um, we will see you all soon. Take care. <laughs>